Schaefer and the former director of the Israel Security Agency, the, the Shabak. Under his leadership, the Shabak restructured its mission and in so doing is credited for drastically reducing the number of terrorist attacks in Israel during the Palestinian launched Al-Aqsa Antifada. He served in the elite Sayeret Matkal unit of the IDF and he has previously held positions of the Minister of Internal Security, the Minister of Home Front Defense in the Israeli cabinet. Please welcome Avi Dichter. Well, shalom and good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you here in Jerusalem uh, with so many people who are so dedicated to such a mission as to make sure that justice or tzedek will be done with so many people who suffered so many years from terrorist attacks. And uh, I know it from very close over the last 45 years and uh, I really appreciate quite a lot the way that you are fighting, you're fighting. And uh, I was supposed to be a lawyer many years ago. Post the military service, uh, my mother, uh, just after the Yom Kippur War, I finished my compulsory service. And she called me and said, uh, so what are you going, to, where are you going to study medicine? I said, Mom, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be a doctor. So she said, never mind, a lawyer is very good as well. <laughs> I said, Mom, I'm not going to be a lawyer. So she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm, uh, I said, I'm sorry, it's, uh, I just have to learn a new language. So she looked at me and said, English is very, very important. <laughs> I said, Mom, it's not going to be English. <laughs> so what language are you going to learn? I said, Arabic. So she looked at me and said to my father in Yiddish, the king daf zayn a doctor, the child should see a doctor. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> I'm sorry I can't speak you, with you uh, as a lawyer, but I believe that it's balancing it by talking to you as someone who worked in the field years ago in the army and then in Sayarat Matkal, Shin Bet and the minister. So I think I've learned the whole problems from all kinds of positions. And I know that in Israel, you know, we are trying all the time to demonstrate the situation, not just as a case, not even just as a worst case, but it should be the worst case scenario. If it's not the worst case scenario, it's meaningless. We are just suffering a wave of terror attacks over the last uh, eight, nine months, but people in Israel started to call it an intifada, the third intifada. When I told them, I'm sorry, we know exactly when started the first intifada in 87, December 9th. When was the second intifada? 29 September 2000. And we don't know to say when this intifada, or so-called intifada started. It means it's not an intifada. It's enough to say a tough flow of terror activities. We've suffered enough victims, enough people got injured. The trauma was pretty complicated for many people. But no, in Israel, it should be the worst case scenario. Recently, a minister of the government, just two months ago, resigned from the government, which is okay. But no, he resigned from the government and right away went to the media and said, the third temple is going to crash. Hey man, the third temple is not Lego bricks build. 
It's not going to crash just because you left uh, the government. <laughs> but, or a former Minister of Defense, he wants to say something bad about the government he served for years. So, the soft word he found in his pocket was, it's a kidnapped government, not less than that. You know, it reminds me always about the old story about a couple who is going to the doctor to get the results of an MRI test. I don't know how it's in the States. In Israel, we, we talk jokes about Polish people. I'm Polish, so it's okay. <laughs> and uh, so Bronya and Jacek are going to the doctor, and Bronya said, Jacek, I'm not going to go, to, to go inside. I'm too nervous. You go and bring me the results. So he got in an hour, two hours. He comes out and says, what have you done two hours at the doctor? He looked and said, Bronya, get into the car. We are going back home. You are not driving until you give me the results. So he looked at her and said, Bronya, your mother is moving to live with us. <laughs> What's the hell the doctor has to do with my mother? He said, I don't know. He told me we have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. <laughs> the <laughs> That's... That's how it works in Israel. <laughs> but trust me, we have enough troubles. <laughs> we are living in a Middle East, in a chaotic Middle East. That started six years ago, things that never happened here for hundreds of years. Since the sykes picot agreement at the First World War. We had Egypt, twice, and the revolution against Hosni Mubarak. And when people thought that the liberals are going to take over, the Muslim Brotherhood came and took over. Muslim Brotherhood. It's a very, very fanatic terror organization or terror movement with a very extremist ideology. Nothing is between different between them and ISIS, except that ISIS doesn't have such a profound ideology like Muslim Brotherhood, who was established in 1928. And when they took Egypt, it was a very frightening situation. For us, we've signed the peace treaty with Egypt. We started to implement it in 1982. So what's now? We, Israel, the United States, European countries, Arab countries, started to pour billions to understand how we are going to collect information about a new state that has a peace treaty with Israel, but it's Muslim Brotherhood. And the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, we, the Jews and the Christians, we are meaningless. We are not supposed to be. Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, was toppled, nobody predicted it. Muslim Brotherhood ran Egypt for two years. And then Abdel Fattah Sisi, the current president, launched a military coup. A military coup after two years against Muslim Brotherhood who appointed him as Minister of Defense. Nobody, neither our intelligence services, nor the uh, CIA, MI6, Bende, general intelligence in Arab countries, nobody even forecasted it's going to happen or predicted it might happen. And, uh, but it happened. We chose us all the limits of intelligence services. And it's not ending by Egypt. Although I know that when, Hosni, when uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi launched the military coup and uh, people didn't want to agree it was a military coup because if it is a military, a military coup, he's not allowed to get the uh, security aid from the U.S. According to the United States uh, rules, you are not allowed to pay uh, any aid to a country that the regime was taken by a military coup. 
So I remember once I told them it's a military coup, they said, no. An Egyptian guy said, no, no, uh, Avi, I beg to differ. It's not a military coup. I said, so what was it? He said, it was a revolution by the people. <laughs> I asked him, who said it's a revolution by the people? He said, even Abdel Fattah Sisi himself stated it's a revolution by the people. <laughs> so I told him, it reminds me the uh, story about the Jewish state in Poland when the moil, it took me a while to explain what's a moil. <laughs> so, the Egyptian guy, by the way, assisted me and helped me to explain it in English. I didn't know the word. And uh, the Jewish moil, uh, the rabbi, in his office at the window, he put a cake of three floors with candies and marshmallows and cream and everything. And people asked him, Rabbi Moshe, why do you put such a cake in your window? And he looked at them and said, what do you want me to put? <laughs> so what do you expect Abdel Fattah Sisi to say? <laughs> Syria, Bashar al-Assad, was about to be toppled. I personally heard the leaders of Israeli intelligence services and in some other countries, they predicted that Bashar al-Assad has single months, if not weeks. All of them are not in job today, except one, Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> Which shows us all that we are very, very problematic in forecasting events in the Middle East. Yemen, the Houthis, I remember just three years ago when I spoke about the Houthis in Yemen, people told me, Avi, where did you bring the Houthis from? Who are they? They conquered Yemen. Iraq is an old story. So when we speak about the Middle East, the Middle East that we are living in, so we are the only stable island, with all jokes about the Israelis, and, but we are the only stable island. We have normal elections every two, or three, or four years. <laughs> but democratic. And uh, thank God we have a strong economy. We have a strong society. We have babies more than many other minorities in the, in the whole world. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, I myself, I have five grandkids and the six is about to be in Israel in a few days. So for the beginning, it's okay. It's, uh, I told my son that uh, he's supposed to have the six, uh, the new baby. I told him he's going to be the sandwich baby. They remember it. <laughs> but when we are looking around us and watching this earthquake, I don't know how much is in the Richter scale, but it's definitely nine on the Dichter scale. It's, it's, a, it's something that really shakes the whole Middle East. And we have to make sure that the state of Israel, our house, our buildings, will be strong enough. Because Egypt today looks stable, but the whole Egyptian pyramid stands on its tip. One man show, Abdel Fattah Sisi. And what if something happens? There are still millions of Muslim brothers in Egypt. What if in Jordan something is getting changed due to what's going on around it? Iran that runs three to four proxies. Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, the Houthis in Yemen, and the fourth recent proxy is the Shiite militias in Syria and Iraq, which is bigger than Hezbollah, or big as Hezbollah. Nobody heard about them, but they're activating on the ground. So we, I believe, have to be very careful about saying, all right, this state, the state of Israel, is strong, flourishing. People are doing great jobs. And uh, we have Jerusalem that we've never heard before. So we can go to the beach, 
and uh, minimize the budget of the security troops, including the IDF, and let the Arab countries around us to get into trouble between themselves and among themselves. I think it will be a mistake. And uh, we've seen it before. I think that uh, one of the main threats ahead of us is to have too many areas as no man's land. Syria today is a no man's land. Gaza is partly no man's land. Sinai, also partly no man's land. Lebanon, also a kind of a no man's land. And we have to understand that the West Bank might become a no man's land. It was a no man's land. That's why we entered during the defensive fleet operation in 2002, post the horrible terror attack, suicide bombing in Park Hotel in Natania at the Passover ceremony. So we penetrated all villages, neighborhoods, and refugee camps in the West Bank in order to make sure that we can detain thousands of terrorists. That's the name of the game. You don't crack down on terrorists by airstrikes. Never mind if you are the Israeli fleet, the American fleet, or the British fleet, or any other kind. You crack down on terrorists only by using both airstrikes and ground troops. And we always hear that uh, if we are not going to sign a peace treaty with Mahmoud Abbas, the current president of the Palestinian Authority, we won't find anyone after him to sign a peace treaty with. And we just heard yesterday the news about the leader of the opposition in Israel agreed upon a contract with Mahmoud Abbas that if he would have been one day the prime minister, or if he were the prime minister, he would sign right away the peace treaty with Mahmoud Abbas, giving back 100%, 100% of the territory up until 67 line, with a swap of 4%, Jerusalem and international supervision, and that's it, and uh, I'm Israel Chai. And I say, what does it mean? What about Gaza Strip? Today is June 16. June 07, Hamas took over Gaza Strip in a military coup. Mahmoud Abbas, his last visit to Gaza was nine and a half years ago. Have you ever seen a president of an area with 45% of his people that he didn't visit for nine and a half years. What does it mean? How can we negotiate with him about the peace treaty, giving back 100% of, Ga of Gaza we already gave, giving 100% of the West Bank, and hey man, you are, you, you are not ruling and you're not running the Gaza Strip. What about the Oslo Agreement? 23 years after, do you call it a success? I'm not sure. 23 years after, we started with a, a debate about one state solution or two state solution. But practically, we are living today in a three state solution. The state of Israel, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and the so-called Palestinian Authority under Hamas and Gaza Strip. So where is the, the lesson that we are learning from mistakes we've made. I'm telling you, it's in Hebrew, we call it chasamba. In English, it's probably hardy boys or whatever. That's not the way we are expect our leaders to promote peace talks. No, no, that's not the way. We have here 8.5 million people. 75% Jews, 25% non-Jews mainly Arabs, part of the state of Israel. We have to make sure that this country will stay strong and hopefully in peace. But 
Not for 10 years. Not for 100 years. We've just got back 68 years ago. We gave in 47 at the partition plan before the state was established, November 47, we agreed. We agreed to get 55%, only 55% of the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley. And Jerusalem under international supervision. The Arabs rejected it. And we went into the independence war. And afterwards, we got 78% of the land with part of Jerusalem. We finished it in 67. So we don't want to learn any lessons from our history. What's going on? I'm telling you that in fighting terrorists, and thank God they all, during the last 43 years since the Yom Kippur War, all our wars and combats were against terrorists. Not even one against an army. After three wars, Independence War, Sinai War, Six Day War, and Yom Kippur War, since then all our wars are against terrorists. And I know that uh, your conference is uh, focused on uh, laws of war. It's different when you deal with armies or you deal with terrorists. Terrorists have no law. They have no morals, no values. They have only one target, killing Jews because they are Jews. That's it. And I'm telling you, over the last 45 years, that's the strongest and the biggest message I've got from them. From all kinds of terrorists. Here in West Bank, Gaza Strip, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, you name it. And I think that we have to be well aware about the fact that those who are trying to find what I call fair play against terrorists. I remember, including when I was in Shin Bet or in security military service, people used to say, hey, it's a terrorist who is carrying a gun. Let's send the troops with a gun. And I said, why a gun? We're a country. We're a state. We're an army. We're not a bunch of terrorists. So they say, so what do you mean? You want to drop a bomb from the air? I said, yes. If it's needed, F-16 against M-16 rifle, it's OK. <laughs> that's, that's the way we want to reach a target, to hit it, and to secure our people, including our soldiers. If the best way to make sure that the our terrorists is going to be killed or arrested, and it's needed an F-16 bomb, so it will be an F-16 bomb. If all that you need in order to kill him is just a small cell phone who explodes in his ear, it's OK. It's more expensive. <laughs> but don't search for a fair play against terrorists, because I'm telling you, I've met too many people in my life who try to fight a fair play because they have values and they got killed. And I appreciate very much the president of the Supreme Court of Israel, Aaron Barak, when he said, a country who is fighting terrorists has to do it with one hand tied behind, behind the back. And to be honest, I don't know about countries. I've never seen a warrior, a combatant, a soldier, a security man who is fighting against terrorists with one hand behind his back. 
What I did see are people victims who got killed when they were tied behind the back. And that's not going to happen as far as, it de as I can follow it. It's not going to happen to us. We've paid a very high price in too many cases when we thought that there is a kind of a fair play against terrorists. I myself doesn't believe in it. I never send people ordering them, you fight a fair play. It's not the Olympic Games. It's not any other competition. It's a fight against terrorists, which means that you have to use all your tools in order to win the war. And the main challenge ahead of us concern with the terrorists in Gaza Strip and the West Bank is to destroy the military infrastructure of the terrorists. It can be done by Arab countries, led by Egypt or any other Arab country, by the Palestinian Authority, or it will have to be done by the Israeli forces. Because we haven't signed a peace treaty with Egypt accepting the demilitarization of all Sinai Peninsula from weapon and to get between Sinai and Israel a 330 square kilometer with a terror organization equipped like an army. We can't do it with Hezbollah in Lebanon. It's a different situation. So we have to make sure that the deterrence that we have created against Hezbollah will be maintained. And when Hassan Nasrallah, the commander and the spiritual leader of Hezbollah, by the way, they don't have military wing and political wing. I know that we have too many Israelis who are thinking about the system, not just Israelis, including Americans. That, I mean, everything that you have in America, you have it here 10 years later. That's uh, normally. So we have too many people very smart, very uh, brilliant. But they are trying to analyze terrorists like they analyze the Israeli system or the Western countries' the system. You have a military wing and you have a political wing. No, Hassan Salah is the military and the spiritual leader. Ali Ohani in Iran is the same. Sheikh Yassin uh, al Hamo is the same. And I think we don't, we haven't seen George Habash was the same. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in, uh, in ISIS in uh, Iraq, Syria is the same. Osama bin Laden was the same. So we have to make sure that the deterrence is forever. When Hassan Salah said post the second war in Lebanon, had I known that that's going to be the Israeli response post the kidnapping and murdering of the two Israeli soldiers, I wouldn't have given the orders to do it. That's deterrence. We have another problem that I'm not sure that all of us are fully aware of it. We are arguing about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and in too many cases we speak about the right of return. And you ask yourself, who are those who are able to return, who are authorized to return, who have the title refugees? You know, it's amazing. And I think it's the first time that I'm speaking about it in, a, uh, in front of such an audience. You know, in 1950, post the independence war, the United Nations, UNRWA was established, and the United Nations had a survey in Gaza. In 1950, there were in Gaza, in refugee camps, 170,000 people. 170,000 people. Today, according to the same UNRWA survey, in Gaza Strip, in refugee camps, there are 520,000 refugees. How come? 
I started my career in Jabalia refugee camp. It was 27,000 people in Gaza. Today, it's 110,000 people. UNRWA is focused just on the Palestinians. It was established for the Palestinian refugees. The United Nations has an organization who deals with refugees all over the world. You know how many people are working in this uh, job? Very, very important one. 10,000 people. 10,000 people work with the whole refugees worldwide. With the Palestinian refugees, it's five million and something refugees all over. There are 30,000 employees who work for UNRWA. In Gaza Strip only, there are 11. I mean, in Gaza Strip, you have more employees of UNRWA than you have all over the world, people who work for the United Nations for, with refugees. And then you ask yourself, so how come that the Palestinian Authority is not really or meaning seriously to go forward with us. In my of my talks with uh, years ago with the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, I told them, you have a very significant problem that if you are not going to solve it, it's going to create you an obstacle. It's true. It's causing us an obstacle as well. So they asked me, what is it? I said, refugees. Refugee is not just a status. Refugee is a state of mind. You cannot build the country and you cannot build your state when so many people define themselves refugees. I told them, we in Israel, we established the country with refugees. People who came from North Africa, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, all of Yemen, all of them were refugees, left all assets behind. The other part of refugees came from East Europe, including my parents. They left all assets behind, but above all, they left family members be behind that got murdered during the Holocaust. They don't even know where they are buried. I bear the name of my grandfather, I just was last passed over the village of the Shtetl in Ukraine for the first time. Just to see what does it mean. I'm telling you, you can't believe that in one day 5,000 Jews were murdered in one day, 22nd of August, 42, just because they were Jews. They were taken from the ghetto to the place where they, to the mass grave were shot six, 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 up until the end of the day, 5,000 people. I told them we, my parents came as refugees like thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of Jews. Never mentioned at home the word refugee. Never. Even during the 50s, I remember as a small child, when it was a starvation in Israel. Starvation. They, they appointed, Prime Minister Ben-Gurion at that time appointed the minister for starvation. They gave him a very... Uh, polite name, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to translate it, Sarah Tsena, a very sophisticated Jewish name. But it was the, the minister of salvation. He was in charge of starvation, of solving the starvation. So one day he came to the Ivan Gurion and told him, uh, Prime Minister, we have no food to give the people. He said, I appointed you as a minister to solve the problem, not to describe it to me. <laughs> and he said, that's why I'm here. He said, what do you mean? He said, I have a good idea. What is it? We are going to wage a war against the United States. <laughs> Go ahead, he said. And then we're going to lose, and they're going to bring us Marshall, Marshall Project to Israel. <laughs> and David Gurion, who was a very, very smart leader, looked at him and said, and if we win? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that I think that when we are living now in Israel and want to really know about what should be done in order to build a stronger society in a more secured area with neighbors, with neighbors, 
we are fed up of taking off from here overseas just via Ben Gurion Airport and landing only in Ben Gurion Airport. We want to be like in other countries, to go from Paris to Belgium and from Paris to Madrid and from Paris to Germany by car. We can't do it. Even though we have peace treaty with Egypt and we have a peace treaty with Jordan, it's a very cold, if not a frozen peace treaty. But it's, ne it's never mind. It's better a frozen peace situation than a hot war. Trust me as someone who participated in some wars. But we have to make sure that we are not taking risks that the next generation, our kids, our grandkids, and our great grandkids, that they will suffer because we were not smart enough and patient enough. So we have patience. We are not in a hurry. Thank God we are doing well. Thank God we, are, we do know how to secure ourselves. We know how to build the country, how to teach our kids, how to absorb people from other countries, how to bring tourists. And uh, we are not in a hurry. We have a history of 3,300 years. And uh, we are just at the beginning of 68 years. We are just a baby compared to our history. So we have to be very, very aware of what can be done, should be done, but we don't have to make mistakes that will pay the price later on. We have to take risks, but not two legs in the air, at least one leg. I know that in basketball, Cleveland won yesterday when the best players were two legs in the air. That's in basketball. In real life, it doesn't work. Here you have to be with one leg, strong leg, on the ground, or as Lev Yashko, the Prime Minister of Israel, post uh, Ben Gurion, he was the Minister of Finance when Ben Gurion was the Prime Minister, and people asked him, how do you see your leader, Prime Minister Ben Gurion? He said, I follow Ben Gurion with closed eyes. And uh, then he added something, he said, but from time to time I open one eye to make sure that Ben-Gurion doesn't go with two closed eyes. <laughs> so I think that we have to be smart and uh, loyal to our heritage and knowing that we are six million and something Jews in Israel. We are six million and something Jews overseas. Here in Israel, we hope that we shall get bigger over the years. In other countries, mainly in the US, we hope that we shall not be smaller over the years. And we have six million, that, that's a number that will never change. Thank you very much.